Well, welcome to our raised bed gardening class. We're glad to have both of you here with us in person today. We got several people registered for the uh, recording. So if you're joining us on the recording, welcome as well. Uh, just a few things. This is part of our uh, gardening series for this year. We, we're going to have classes scheduled all the way through the end of May, minus the weeks that we're doing the Master Gardener classes. Um, and we actually have it on our website now. If you've uh, registered Eventbrite, if you haven't got it, if you didn't attend the last class, uh, I sent out a link to our website that will have the recording, the survey, and all the registration information for the upcoming classes, and we'll be updating that as we go along. Um, so today is Raised Bed Gardening, and um, this is a class that I've done for several years on raised beds. Raised beds are very popular. They're very convenient, uh, but we'll jump right into this. Now, most of this, um, you know, I'm assuming that most of you all have raised bed gardens that you're um, using somewhere at home or wherever you're using it, uh, community garden or whatever. So I'm assuming you have some experience with raised bed gardening. Uh, you have experience with raised bed gardening, so a little bit. Um, so just like last time, if you're on Zoom here, um, you know, feel free to ask questions. Feel free to unmute because I don't have anybody monitoring for comments. So please unmute and ask questions if you have any as we go along. So we'll jump in here. Maybe. There we go. So just a few benefits of raised beds. I'm not going to spend a lot of time on this, but raised beds very, uh, are very easy to incorporate in the landscape. It can bring the garden a little closer to home. Uh, we can use raised beds to increase accessibility. Um, primarily, what we use them for is to overcome poor quality soil or poor terrain. So if you have very steep terrain, you can incorporate raised beds into your landscape and onto your property very easily where you couldn't do that with a traditional garden plot. The raised bed, the soil won't wash away because it's all contained in the bed. And you can incorporate, like I said, into the landscape. Um, you can overcome space limitations to an extent. We'll talk about this a little bit and some concepts that we need to make sure we remember in raised bed gardening. Um, you can have deeper soil and uncompacted root zone. And so if you have an area around your house where the soil is mostly topsoil or work soil. Um, a lot of times you'll get that compacted soil layer or it may be poor quality soil. So a lot of times in construction, we try to get them to remove the topsoil and set it to the side to put it back over the lawn or the surrounding landscape, but that doesn't always happen. Um, and so that's, that's one of the big limitations around construction. And so with raised beds, you can bring in your soil and you can have a good quality soil and garden uh, when you couldn't otherwise in a traditional garden setting. It can take years to take soil that has been disturbed to add organic matter and add amendments and to add other soil back to it, like raised bed soil or whatever in a traditional garden setting. It can take many, many years to get the soil quality up to what it needs to be. Uh, to, to really get this kind of soil you're looking for. And so raised beds, you can do that very quickly because you're bringing your soil into the area. You can grow more with less um, because you don't, you know, traditional road gardens were made because we had tractors or we were working with livestock. And you had to have rows because you had to get the equipment down the rows. Um, plants don't necessarily need to be planted, or vegetable plants, flower plants, they don't necessarily need to be planted in rows. You want it somewhat organized, but you don't have to have it in rows. We, we did rows because we were mostly cultivating with tractors or uh, with animals, and you had to have a place for the animals to walk. You had to have a place for the tractor tires uh, when you were growing. And so we can grow more with less space. You could get more plants in a smaller area with raised beds. Uh, you can also have fewer weeds because when you bring in the soil, you're not bringing in the weed seed. Um, and then you can also, also very easily adapt raised beds for season extension by adding hoop structures or row covers or, you know, you can build uh, cold frames on these beds fairly easily and quite cheaply, actually, with, with lower expense. So um, you can use, you can adapt raised beds very easily to season extension. 
uh, and that works very, very well. So let's talk a little bit about construction. So basically, in traditional road gardens, you can raise bed garden in that manner. So uh, most of you all know at Davis Farms, that's my family. We use raised bed gardening on a larger scale. All of our beds are raised. They're raised four to six inches. Uh, we do that with machinery, and then we lay the plastic on top of those raised beds. That is a form of raised bed gardening. We're doing that on a commercial scale. Um, so we're doing that in production in airfields, and we have good soil. Uh, and so this is kind of just the, the basic option. You go into your garden instead of just planting directly into the cultivated soil, mound up the raised bed in traditional garden setting. Uh, six inch constructed raised beds. Uh, this is kind of our minimal expense. And then there's also the greater than six, which is usually for accessibility reasons that we do this. You know, you can uh, more more easily access your vegetables or whatever you're growing in those beds. And usually those taller raised beds are easier to work into your landscaping and your landscape design. And so option three is probably what comes to mind for most people with raised beds. Uh, although I understand that these concepts apply in these other two options as well. You know, smaller raised beds, we're not necessarily talking 36 inch raised beds. It could be four to six inch. It doesn't have to be that large. So you can adapt this to whatever system you want or whatever size bed you want. Raised beds can be almost any length. However, they're not usually more than four feet wide. The most common width is three feet, and that's because of accessibility. You gotta be able to reach across those beds from both sides um, and be able to, to work your, your vegetables or flowers or whatever you're putting into your beds. Uh, materials, there are lots of materials that we can use for raised beds. The sky's the limit. Um, natural wood, you know, until the last, probably pre-COVID, most raised beds that I saw were made out of natural wood, usually landscaping timbers that were untreated or a natural hardwood. Um, or, you know, those woods that were naturally resistant to decay. Um, we want to avoid treated wood if possible, although nowadays the treatments are not as harsh as they used to be prior to 2002. Um, however, there's no research out there on a lot of these different treatments that we're aware of that could say that you're not contaminating your soil with treated wood. Okay, um, We don't really have any research that says you are contaminating your soil with treated wood. What we do know is back in the 90s when raised bed gardening really first took off, um, railroad ties were usually very accessible, they were cheap, they were usually free, and a lot of people made these nice little raised beds. We had them in all the schools here in Yancey County when I was a kid. They were made out of railroad ties that were creosote treated. We now know that creosote can leach into the soil and it can stay there for up to seven to nine years, it can give off an odor even after it breaks down. Um, you don't have creosote treated material anymore, even the railroad ties are not treated with creosote. Um, and also, we had lumber that was treated with uh, chromate copper arsenic. This is an older lumber. If you have any older pressure treated lumber, it may have um, it may have been treated uh, with with known carcinogens, basically. Uh, this lumber is no longer available for residential use, but it's not banned by the EPA. So if you go to, you know, the local hardware store, or if you go to Summits or Heritage or whatever here locally, and you purchase pressure treated uh, materials, it is not treated with this treatment anymore because they're not allowing it. However, it's not banned, meaning that if there was any lumber out there treated with this, it can still be used. But you're not finding this much anymore. Um, there's also alkaline copper ordinary treatment, uh, which contains copper, which can leach into the soil from treated lumber. And, you know, sometimes this can be harmful to plants. Um, that's, that's kind of the, the basis on the treatment. But now tr the treatments are all over the board. There are so many wood treatments out there. You don't really know what, what pressure treated lumber is treated with. Um, and what I've seen in most cases, when you go to purchase lumber, 
They can't give you a treatment spec. Um, I've never been able to get that. You should be able to ask for that for something with a treatment, but it's not like our chemicals. It doesn't come with material safety data sheets most of the time. Um, so we're not really sure what the wood's treated with. So just as a general rule of thumb, avoid treated wood if possible. Um, yes, ma'am. It's just real, real short. Um, so we we did once have creosoted guys. Um, is, is the odor the only problem? I mean, is it poisonous in some way? It, it can be. The creosote contains heavy metals. Okay. And that's what can be an issue. Some plants will take up those heavy metals. But, and there's no research that shows this. It's all theory, right? There's Nobody's really done research to quantify it. Mm -hmm. um, did you all hear the question on Zoom? She was asking about the creosote. Um, you know, there's no research that really shows it, but we've seen some observances with some types of plants where some of those heavy metals can actually get into the fruit. Some of those heavy metals are toxic to your system. So that's what we're trying to avoid. Thanks. Good question. You all, again, feel free to unmute if you have a question. Uh, wooden pallets, they should have a marking somewhere on them like this marking that you see here. Um, check that marking because you should be able to go by this code that's right here, look that up and see what those if those pallets are treated or what they're treated with. This should tell you the type of wood. Most of our pallets today are made out of cedar, uh, what I've seen the most of. Uh, we don't see as many pine anymore unless it's like heavy industrial pallets. Uh, just because of some pests that got into our pine forest and different things. Uh, so we see a lot of cedar wood, cedar pallets, that kind of stuff. I've seen a lot of poplar pallets. Um, and now we're actually getting to where a lot of companies are getting away from wood pallets. They're getting into plastics, that kind of thing. Um, so if you like the idea of a recyclable raised bed, you know, you're taking pallets and you're building a raised bed out of it. Just understand there should be a, uh, this kind of sticker somewhere on the pallet that tells you uh, what type of material and what kind of treatment it has. Um, and where do you look up those photos? Uh, I just Google it, honestly. Okay. Just, just do a web search. Um, this IPPC, I can't, International Plant Protection Convention logo, uh, you should be able to look up on the International Protection of Plant, Plant Protection Convention website and they do they used to have a a, a, a guide that told all those codes um, so this will tell you more about it the first number that or the first letters they tell you the country of origin it's country code um, then you have these over here I'm gonna move this so you can see it in here in just a second that tells you the treatment so this this, this basically, HT is heat treatment. I do know that one. Mm -hmm. um, so heat treatment's okay. Um, it would tell you a little bit different if it was chemical treatment. And then the last, there is... I can get my... There we go. Uh, so that where it had that HT was telling you that basically the DB is like a dry... A, a dry treatment and the HT is heat treatment. So that particular marking, it was not chemically treated. It was not chemically pressure treated. Um, and oh yeah, I didn't put this in here. I did look this up. I couldn't remember. So there you go. Heat treated, debarked, or kiln dried is what the HTDB and KD stands for. Uh, the one that you want to look out for is methyl bromide treatment. I haven't been able to find this in a really long time because they basically outlaw methyl bromide in a lot of applications. Um, there may be some new ones out there. I haven't checked it recently. There may be some new chemical treatments uh, on some of this, these wooden pallets. Uh, also, a lot of people like to use the plastic pallets like from drink companies or you know, soda companies or whatever. Um, metal, you want to make sure that it's painted or galvanized mostly because you don't want it rusting down in a short amount of time. Um, you can also use uh, materials manufactured for recycled goods. 
Uh, I really like beans just because you're taking something that would have went into the landfill and you've turned it into something beneficial. Uh, and most of these look pretty well. Most of these are usual purchased, um, you know, with your recycled recycle materials, but you can say go to a restore or something like that and buy block or stone. Uh, and that's recycled building materials as well. Um, straw bales, this is for a single season. We'll hit this at the end, uh, talking about it. And then also there's all, always block, rock, or landscape stone, um, and then reused or recycled materials such as tires, block, untreated wood, tile, those kinds of things. So lots of materials that you can build and, or construct your own raised beds. Of course, you can always purchase as well. Um, this become very popular since COVID. I know I've seen in the last two weeks probably 30 advertisements for places to purchase raised beds. Um, there's the galvanized kind like you see in this bottom picture here uh, on my bottom left. I'm looking at the screen. Um, you know, those, I've seen those advertised at like half price from Harbor Freight last week. You know, so you can get these kits and put them together. They're relatively easy. Uh, here in the middle, this is mostly inside, but this was recycled material of the picture that I took. I don't remember where I took that picture, where I got that picture. Um, some of these are just ripped off the internet. You know, you can find these um, plastic or galvanized raised bed kits. And then, of course, you can build your own out of tires. This was an old construction tire that the center was cut out of. Um, you know, and here's the pallet gardens like I was talking about. Uh, that's kind of a, it was popular at one time. I haven't seen too much on it. And then, of course, made out of stone or, or walk or landscape and stone. Worked really well when they're incorporated into the landscape. So this is something that's kind of unique. The potato tire garden It's something you might want to try. Um, and I've done this. I took about four pounds of potatoes, I think, and made close to a bushel and a half one time. <laughs> um, so you can do this very easily. Um, potatoes like a soil pH of 5.6 to 6.2, so a little more on the acidic side, which is perfect for most compost mixtures. Uh, avoids potato scab. If you don't know what potato scab is, that's when you dig your potatoes and it's got a little round spotches all over it. That's potato scab. A lot of people think that's wire worms. It could be wire worms. You're not usually going to see wire worms in a living state. Um, so more than likely, if you're growing potatoes in a, a home garden raised bed situation and you see those spots, it is potato scab. And that forms usually when the pH of the soil mixture gets too high. Mm -hmm. So above 6.2, when you get into 6.8, 7.0 from applying too much lime, it's not good for growing potatoes. Um, use tire, you can use tires to grow your potatoes in layers, and basically what you do is you take your seed potato, I like to cut mine in two, just something I've always done to make it go a little farther. You put uh, a few pieces in this tire, depending on the size of the tire, usually two to three potatoes per layer in each tire um, that you put in there. And then uh, basically you want to leave a small layer of dirt above the tire. Okay, so fill the tire all the way full, plant your potatoes, or three quarters, plant your potatoes, and then you want to leave about two inches on top of that tire, and then basically you add another one on top of it. And the, the one that I did a few years ago, I think I had it about five tires high. Um, so like I said, I used about two, I don't even know if it's four pounds. I mean, I think I used like 12 potato pieces, cut up potato pieces, and ended up making a bushel and a half. Potatoes. Now, they weren't large potatoes, they were all kind of small, but where it comes in handy is you can actually take this off one layer at a time. And where you leave that layer of soil on top, they will start to grow out the sides. In this picture that you see here, they didn't leave the layer of soil, so you don't see them growing out the sides. But basically, you take off the top layer, you harvest your potatoes, the next layer will begin to grow. You know, so you can you can basically keep new potatoes going, and then in the fall you harvest the whole thing, and that's what I did last time. It worked pretty well. Um, but basically, as the potatoes grow, you add tires in the soil, one inch between the tires. Uh, don't add soil to the next level tire until the potato plants have grown. 
through. So make sure it is growing out. That way you're not stretching them and, and not kill them out because they're not getting enough sunshine. Uh, you can add, and by growing out, I mean like just barely sprouting. So basically you're growing it up the top. And then you bury it with the next tire on top? Mm-hmm. And it'll push up. Yep. Yeah. So you wait till the plant's up that far. You add the next tire and basically add soil around. Oh. And so every time you add soil around it, it's going to grow potatoes from the sun. Um, okay. So it's growing vertically. Yes. Horizontally. Yes. Yeah. It's growing vertically. Yeah. Yeah. It works pretty good. I mean, it works pretty good if you don't have a lot of space. I mean, you can grow quite a, quite a bit. Um, also, I recommend adding two to three tablespoons of 10, 10, 10 to each layer. You can also, there's several organic things that you can use. Um, usually it's a multiple product, so maybe a little blood meal, a little bone meal, uh, a little bit of green sand. If you want an organic recommendation there to add all three nutrient components. So the type of soil, the one thing I'll say on this and the mistake that most people make with this is they'll go and they'll buy a potting mix. Now we have good potting soil mixtures available in the bag. That's something that's happened. Uh, the best thing that's happened for raised bed garden in our area was when Daddy Pete's opened up and started bagging product. Um, that's the best raised bed soil that I've seen out there so far, and I'm not doing that just to brag on Daddy Pete's or to promote them. But that's what I've seen that works the best, and that's why I recommend it. Um, most folks, though, years ago, started making their raised beds, and then they went and filled it with Pro Mix or Miracle Pro potting soil. But the thing about potting soil, you know, we use that to um, we use that to grow bed in plants. <coughs> Excuse me. We use that to grow. Um, hanging baskets and things like that. And it's designed because we, when, when I'm growing, uh, say, a hanging Mother's Day hanging basket, I really lay the fertilize to that mixture. And that's what makes those petunias grow into big petunias. We fertilize that stuff once a week. If, you know, if that's designed to allow most of those salts and most of that fertilizer, honestly, to flow out so that we don't have salt accumulation in the pot. Um, so it's it's not designed to retain nutrients. Even though it has peat moss, it's not designed to hold nutrients like your traditional soil. These raised bed soil mixtures are. They're full of organic matter. They're full of materials and compost um, that, you know, when you get into the soil chemistry, it will hold those nutrients in place better than your potting mix. And so that's one mistake that, that folks often use. Your potting mix over time will develop disease a lot quicker. So don't use those potting mixes. You want to start with a good compost or topsoil. Um, and then, you know, about 60% and then add mushroom compost or composted manure. You can add sun peat, vermiculite. Uh, and then also, if you're using some, some types of compost, like if you're using something that comes from, say, a dead animal processing facility, uh, you'll want to add something like dolomitic lime just to help with the acid and, and mix that in as you put it in. Now, if you're using the daddy pits mixture, it's already it's already adjusted. The pH is already adjusted from the from the company. So you wouldn't want to add lime to daddy pits, but if you're purchasing in bulk, like a certified compost, you may want to test that to see if you need to add in a little lime as you put that into your raised bed. Um, start with a gravel layer at the bottom, sand on the gravel, about two inches according to bed size. Um, you, you know, smaller uh, beds that aren't as deep, you don't have to put that much, of course, because you want that soil layer. But if you're talking 18 inch to 36 inch raised beds, you, you need more gravel in the bottom. And this helps with drainage, just keeps it from, from ponding up water inside your bed and causing you some disease issues. Um, I know the uh, the permaculture and, and some of those things, you know, some of those ideas of putting in branches and, and wood on the bottom and that kind of thing, you know, that, that will work. My biggest issue with that is the type of wood that you put in there and you know what it is, is it's going to cause acidity. 
that will rot over time. So you're going to have to add more raised bed soil anyways. And my major concern with that, putting in the lens and things in the bottom of the bed, is once that breaks down, if you haven't put rock or sand or gravel, will it drain the way that it's supposed to when you add more soil mixture? Now, it may, but that's always been my concern over time. You know, you don't want to be adding soil back to these beds every four or five years. That's pricey. You want to have a good soil that you can use for a long time. And so I've always preferred to spend a little bit on the front end to add more sand and gravel than adding the branches, just because you know you're going to have drainage for years to come. You're going to have the drainage that you want to grow vegetables or whatever the plants you're growing in these beds. Um, so I say avoid sticking those limbs and all that into the bottom of the beds. Um, and, and to be honest with you, that's what our research says, even though I'm in the permaculture department, they do tell you how to do that, that permaculture of adding the sticks and the limbs and, and all that into the bottom of the bed. Um, but that's kind of my take on it. Take it or leave it. You want to do the sticks and limbs, go, go for it, you know, work in it. Uh, but that's just my concern with it. Um, like I said, I'm a big fan of Addy Peets. Um, it's available local. It's usually pretty pretty cheap. Um, you know, six to eight dollars a bag in most cases is what I priced this year. Uh, I know Fox Brothers went out of business. That's where I used to send folks. I think they were like 10 or 12 last year. Um, I don't know if Barn Charm, Barn Charm's moving into that space and they'll have feed and some soil available. I don't know what they're going to retain, but I do know you can get it at Davis Farms. Um, now, just a note, I'm not promoting that place because it's my family place. I'm, I'm, I'm telling you that it's there because it's the only place I know of in the county. If somebody knows of another source, please tell me because I want to make sure we, we, we advertise for all of our businesses. Um, but I like the Daddy Pete's because it's a good product. You know, it's, it's got a name behind it. Um, and I know it works well. I've seen it work well. And this is what I would recommend. So these are the, the different mixes. So this sandy loam, um, this was the, kind of the first thing that they really come out with for raised beds. It works really well. And then you will have to add some mushroom compost or, you know, something like that into the soil. Another thing about this sandy loam is it's not certified organic. So if you want something that's organic, you'll have to go with one of these other products. What I like for a vegetable garden for the base soil is the lawn and garden mix. Um, there's also the raised bed mix. Both of those work pretty well. The lawn and garden's got a little more coarser material in it. Um, so adding mushroom compost, that's a good idea. The raised bed mix is supposed to be ready to go, what they tell me. It's supposed to be ready to go. You're not supposed to add any compost. Uh, it's already got compost mixed in. But it's usually a little more higher price point. So, you know, just kind of figure it, figure what you want. Um, the perennial pleaser, this is more for your flowers. So this is more for, or like berry bushes. If you're doing berry bushes and some small raised beds, that's what that's for. Or if you're put, adding in pollinators somewhere in the garden, you want a pollinator bed or something like that, flower bed. And that's why I throw that in there because you maybe want to raise some flowers in your raised bed. Definitely. Um, if you're mostly vegetables, though, I would go with the other mixes. So when you think about bulk soil and compost sources, there are some around. I haven't done any price comparisons to tell you if one's better or not. Uh, you can use virgin topsoil, but just keep in mind, every soil test I've ever done of a raised bed that had topsoil in it, it comes back as a mineral soil. Low in organic matter and a low uh, cation exchange capacity, which means over time you're going to have to add organic matter pretty much every single year, um, add it to get the organic matter up in those beds. Um, so that's why I'm weary of. A lot of people will say topsoil, but it's really not topsoil. It's topsoil mixed in with all the soil that's underneath. Um, it, it's not bad. But it's not the best. Okay, so just keep in mind if you if you purchase somebody's topsoil somewhere, you're probably going to have to add something to it um, to get that organic matter content and nutrient content up. There are many raised bed soil mixtures available locally. Um, 
What I recommend is that you only purchase from a certified tested location. Um, some sources that I know that they have certified tested product and give you a spec sheet, or they could last year. I haven't checked this year. They could last year. Asheville Mold Char, they had several different blends. The ones that when I talk to them that they recommend is mushroom compost, and then they have one called Amy's Planting Mixture. Uh, I'll tell you, that's pretty bulk. That's got a lot of wood material in it. Uh, it's decomposted, or it's composted bark, uh, decomposed bark, um, and then mushroom compost added in into that mixture. Um, I, I haven't really tested any. It's really, it's usually good for that first year. And then the next year or so, you really have to watch starting adding nutrients and um, uh, organic matter to it from what I've seen. Um, there's also, I know Reams Creek has some by the yard. Um, there used to be another place in Weaverville. I think they shut down the longest yard. They shut down when the, the pulp plant closed there um, in Canton. But you can always check this NC Composting Council map. I put the uh, the link there on the slide where you can see that. Um, another way to do this is just, you know, go on a search and, and type in NC Composting Council map. It'll bring it right up. Uh, if you want that link, if you all are joining me by Zoom and you would like to receive that, you know, shoot me an email. I'll be glad to send that out to you. But you can check that, uh, that map and it'll have various sources that have certified and tested compost. Available in bulk. Um, so we talked about amending, whether you're using topsoil or you're using those bulk mixtures. These are the, the amendments that, that I recommend that I know are available locally. A uh, good old-fashioned white cow has been around a long time. Um, just be careful if you're wanting to go organic. If you want certified organic, make sure because they do have an organic and, and conventional non-organic mixture. So just keep that in mind. Uh, the difference is just the organic comes from cattle that are certified organic, like an organic dairy. The conventional is just composted manure from various places. Um, still works. And there's not much of a concern with it. It's certified. It's got an analysis. It's tested. So if you want to add in cow manure, you can do your price comparison. White cow's okay if you're wanting to amend the baby. Um, my go-to though is usually a mushroom compost. I put data picks up here, but really uh, you can use just about any mushroom compost out there. Uh, it's all pretty much the same stuff. It's all pretty close to the same analysis. Uh, mushroom compost adds a lot of really good organic matter and it'll have seasonally available nitrogen. Um, you know, so adding mushroom compost throughout the year as you grow your, your vegetables or flowers is not a bad idea. But what I typically recommend is each year of your raised bed, add in two to three inches of compost um, and then work that into the top six, eight or six or eight inches of soil before you plant, if you're planting annuals. Um, that's, that's usually my go-to. Uh, you can add some other things if you're if you have a, especially a topsoil that's a, a mineral soil and it's low in organic matter, adding in the manures, be careful with the kicking chicken and the chicken manures. And they're really high in phosphorus, but they're also high in nitrogen. Um, the one thing I would say too on soil amendments, a lot of people just want to go to the neighbor's barn and dig out, you know, composted manure from the barn. Um, you know, that's not a bad practice. It's it's it does have a few concerns. Um, if you dig it out from the neighbor's barn, make sure it's composted. Because when you add raw manure to a bed with living plants, um, the same thing that's happening, if you took the compost class last week, I mentioned this, you know, it actually takes nitrogen for the microbes to decompose and compost product. And so if you're adding raw manure to your raised beds, you'll actually be depleting your beds of nitrogen and making it not available to plants. Um, I've seen cases where, um, you know, it would actually cause deficiencies because they put too much raw manure in the product. Not to mention, though, um, when you're talking about the raw manure, there's also the food safety risk. So we recommend, if you're going to put raw manure on your, on your garden, 
that you do it at least 120 days before harvesting any fruit plants. Uh, and that would go for untested, un uncomposted, non certified so if you dig it out of the neighbor's barn or out of your barn, what I would say is apply that to your raised beds at least 120 days before you harvest. So, you know, you're kind of, if you're harvesting August now, you know, you need to get that in pretty quick. But you can do that. The main issue I have with the neighbor's barn scenario is you don't know the, the nutrient content of that manure. So it's hard for me to really say if it's going to be enough or not. Um, it depends on what the animal's been fed. There's a lot of variations in that. Whereas these products in the bag, they come with a guaranteed analysis right there. You can see this is, this is considered a fertilizer, uh, 0.5, 0.5, 0.5 on that cow manure. 1.5, 1.0, 1.5 on the kicking chicken. Um, this is pretty close to cow manure. I can't remember the... I took the picture of the wrong side of the bag there. Um, but it does have that analysis as well. Why did you say be careful of the kitten chicken? The nitrogen content. So you don't want to. Mm -hmm. It's hot. It's got more mm -hmm. nitrogen in it. So if you pile it up too much, you can. I'm mostly concerned with seedlings. It's not so much for established transplants, but with seedlings, you can have some issues there. Okay. If, it's, if you don't mix it um, and that's that's the biggest issue, plus the price. I mean, you really add more um, phosphorus and, and nitrogen there with the kicking chicken, but it costs a bit more to, to do that. So I would just use this mostly in the cases where your bed's tested really well in soil nutrients when you need to add a lot. So kind of my take-home points here on the raised bed mixture and raised bed maintenance, you want to start with good soil, junk in, junk out, good stuff again. You know, you can't get better than what you start with. Uh, and it'll take a long time to make improvements. Um, you know, also each year as you maintain your beds, make sure to soil test. Um, I actually recommend soil testing vegetable beds every year unless you see consistently that you're coming back with pretty similar results. Um, on a soil test, remember we're only soil testing for phosphorus and, and potassium, uh, and also organic matter, cation exchange capacity, those things, and mostly soil pH. And that's what you want to look out for. It's not as much of a concern if you're using, say, the daddy peats or the, the certified compost. It is a concern when you're using the, the virgin topsoil and you're having to add every year. You know, you're having to add to try to gradually increase the quality of that soil. Um, you know, so make sure you soil test mostly to see the soil pH, but there's also some other things we look at, anion exchange capacity being one of those, uh, and your phosphorus and, and potash levels. Um, you can add nutrient to the soil mixture based on a soil test. I can help you. Um, your soil test is going to come back and it's going to give you basically an analysis. It's going to give you fertilizer options if you look at the list. If you want it to be organic, I can give you a recommendation for organic, which is using different organic amendments um, after I look at that. I've done that for several people, and I'll be glad to do that for you. Um, add to, like I said, add two to three inches of compost annually. Um, I, like to do, I like to do this before you soil test and mix it in real good. Uh, that way you're testing what you're growing in this year. Soil testing is free uh, from April to Thanksgiving. It costs $4 a sample from Thanksgiving to the end of March. So we're about to get back into that free time again for soil testing. Um, and then you go back talking about the compost. I recommend a vegetable bed specifically. Use the certified or tested compost. Uh, I know we had a composting class and we want you to compost at, at home and and make that good compost product. But if you, those of you that were in attendance in that class, if you'll remember, one of the things I said is your home compost pile typically will not heat up to that 131 degrees that's required to kill disease pathogens. And so if you're putting any disease scraps or plant scraps at all in your compost bin, and it has disease on it, you're probably not killing the pathogens in your home compost bin. So I would avoid using that on your vegetable garden or other places to use that in your landscape. 
you know, around your landscape plants, around your fruit trees, it's okay. Um, you, you know, you're not going to transmit too many fruit diseases that way from the compost. But you will transmit blights and bacterial diseases and, and molds and funguses, especially soilborne, if you don't kill the pathogens. Um, so I recommend the certified tested option instead of the home compost option on the vegetable garden. Um, use it on your flowers all day long. You do need to add nitrogen to the soil annually, uh, even though you've got your raised bed and you've got all these nice materials and you've added compost. I typically recommend about two pounds of actual nitrogen per thousand square feet. This is not much per bed. Um, you know, a four by six bed, it's usually 24 square feet. That's about a half a pound of triple 10 per bed um, if you're adding fertilizers. And, you know, basically it would be about a pound and a half of maybe blood meal or, or various ingredients. Um, you're going to need more than one amendment when you're talking about organic recommendations. And that's because we don't have very many organic products like blood meal, bone meal, feather meal, those kinds of things that have a guaranteed analysis, complete analysis that we're looking at here with fertilizers. There are lots of choices. I can work with you on your choices. Again, that soil test is key there uh, to know those other nutrients, but things like liquid fish emulsion, fish emulsion, fish meal, all of those are really good to, to add um, some different products. Green sand for your potash, bone meal for your phosphorus. So there's a combination of things that you can add for an organic recommendation. Um, there's also other nutrients that we'll look at sometimes, uh, such as, but your, your soil test will tell you your majors, phosphorus, potassium, boron, calcium, and zinc, and magnesium, and magnesium, sulfur, they're all minor nutrients. And then, of course, your lime to adjust the soil pH. I'm usually starting here with the lime. That's usually the most important factor of a soil test. And then I'm looking at the phosphorus and potassium. Uh, but nitrogen, of course, you're adding it every single year. The nitrogen cycle is 45 days. What you add in nitrogen before you plant is gone in 45 days. Hopefully, you know, you've got good microbes going on. You've got good uh, stuff going on in the soil to where you're, you're having nitrogen available for the plants naturally. Um, but there is a need to add some in, in most cases. Um, you know, I, I recommend a lot of times with vegetables to fertilize weekly with a vegetable mix when the fruit begins to form um, or add about four ounces of triple 10. You can also add compost regularly throughout the year as you weed, add a little compost, dig it in, you know, just chop it in a little bit for the plants. Um, the compost, you, you basically have to add, you know, a little bit each week once the fruit begins to form. Um, and then it's kind of playing things by sight. So you'll you'll look at your plants, and if they're looking a little yellow, you know you need to add a little nitrogen. If you're seeing purple in and purple stems, uh, you know maybe you need to add phosphorus. If you're seeing purple in on the edges, that's more potassium. Um, you know if you want help with diagnosing issues, if it don't look just right, you can always take a picture and send it to me, and I'll be glad to help you with that. We have our master gardeners who can help with that as well when they're uh, our new Ask a Master Gardener program. So please feel free to take pictures, diagnosing things, diagnosing nutrient issues, plant diseases, all those kinds of things throughout the, the gardening season. Planting, there's the square foot uh, gardening method. Um, so basically, this is an example of it. You basically divide the bed, bed off in of, square feet. You can use this with twine or any kind of string, basically anything that'll draw a line uh, on the edges of the bed. And basically you use that as a reference. Uh, the one thing that I'll say when you're planting your plants, just because it's a raised bed garden doesn't mean you can skimp on in row space. Now you can skimp on between them. Right, so you know, the, in a traditional row garden for tomatoes, for instance, it may say three to four feet between rows and at least eighteen inches between plants. Okay, where you can't you where you can't skip on those requirements is the between plants. 
to 18 inches. Mm -hmm. And the main reason for that is you've got to have good air circulation. And when you plant those tomato plants closer than 18 inches, they're basically competing with each other for light and nutrients. And so you'll produce more. We've done enough research to know on these vegetable crops. When you need 18 inches, you need 18 inches. When you need 12 inches, you need 12 inches. So don't think just because it's a raised bed garden that you can go in and plant plants every six to eight inches. If you do, you're not going to be very happy because you're going to get very small tomatoes and the, the example of tomatoes, very small tomatoes and a lot of disease plants and not as many of them. Um, so um, we have some planting guides, some gardening guides from NC State that tells that recommended plant spacing. Just make sure to remember, just because it's in a raised bed, you, you can't, don't, don't, don't give up that plant spacing. No plant plants closer than that. Um, and so make sure if, if, you know, I don't always measure, I don't do the square foot thing. If you have any sense of, of measurement at all, you can about guess 18 inches, right? I mean, it's, it's not hard to, to figure that out. Um, but if, you, if you're challenged with measurements, this is a, a good method. The square foot garden is a good method. Now, you can offset things. So you see here it's 18 inches. But you see what they've done here basically is they're planting this on this edge and they're kind of planting around these edges in this in this garden. And so you can get closer rows, so you get more plants per bed that way. But what they're doing basically is you, you notice there's a plant in this uh, quadrant, there's a plant in this quadrant, um, this plant is actually supposed to be in that quadrant, <laughs> and then you should have another one in this, this quadrant right here and it should alternate throughout that bed. And so you can actually get more rows of plants in the bed, um, but you're still maintaining that 18 inch, roughly 18 inch spacing between the plants. And you're just kind of offsetting the different rows to get more plants in. And can you put other things between them? Yes, you can. Yes, absolutely. Um, so I know Kavita uh, with Vivian, I don't know if she's on here today, she might be busy, but um, I know she's a big fan of companion planting, and I am too. Um, you know, you can come in with smaller plants, leafy greens, herbs, things that like shade. Um, you can come in with pollinator flowers. You can come in with uh, low, any kind of low-growing plant, lettuce, greens, radishes, those kinds of things. And you can actually plant more in between rows in those beds, and it'll be fine. Just make sure, like tomatoes are a very heavy nitrogen user, you don't want to plant another heavy nitrogen user with, with those tomatoes, for instance. Um, you know, and that's kind of the, the, the original companion planting, of course, was the three sisters, which was the corn, the, the squash, and the beans. Um, you know, and, and that's that's the traditional example, but there are lots of things that you can grow in this bed with that. Um, herbs are great, like basil. Basil, for instance, even if you're not going to use all of it and it's going to go to flower, basil is a great pollinating plant. It'll draw in bees. Uh, and, and they're really good for pollinating a lot of these crops. Um, so, good question. Do any of you all on Zoom have any questions for us? Feel free to unmute and talk to us if you have any questions. No, we we'll just got one. But feel free at any time just to unmute and interrupt me. I don't care yet. Um, Raised beds and vegetables. Vegetables need about one acre an inch per week. Um, that's what's recommended. It's a lot of water. <laughs> a lot of water. So I do recommend if you have a raised bed to take a little time and, and put in a drip irrigation kit. The one thing I'll say on these kits, and we discussed it earlier here in the room, um, most of the drip irrigation kits out there, they're readily available. Um, most of those are designed to be on a pressurized system. So if you have rain barrels, for instance, it may not be the best uh, setup to try to go drip irrigation because you can't get the pressure to maintain the system. Um, I have heard that there are some out there that use low pressure methods of drip irrigation. I don't have any experience with those. Um, but definitely, if you have access to a hose bin, putting in drip irrigation is a plus. You know, it's a lot better to drip irrigate than it is even to use like a solar hose or a um, overhead, definitely. 
Because every time you water overhead, you're adding moisture, which causes disease issues. And we'll talk a lot in like crops that are very, uh, very subject to disease, such as tomatoes, for instance. You want to keep the moisture off the foliage as much as possible. And so if you can, if you can uh, use drip irrigation, it works a lot better. We also know, you know, the, the old timers, old time gardeners used to tell me that uh, a slow drizzle for a day is better than a hard thunderstorm for an hour when it comes to water and plants. There's a lot of truth to that. We know from research that using drip irrigation, putting out water very slowly, that we're using more of that water and we're having more effective use of that water when we when we put it out there in that manner. If you put out a soaker hose or overhead, most of it is going to um, it's going to be gone. It's going to vaporize, right? It, it's going to be lost to the atmosphere. It's not going to benefit the plants, or it's going to run off. One of those two things. When water runs off, you're also losing nutrients out of your soils. And so drip irrigation will actually help maintain those nutrients in those soils. There are several different kits available. I like these raised bed kits. You can incorporate them into your landscaping. You can have permanent systems that you drain in the wintertime. Uh, you've got permanent raised beds. This is a win-win situation. It's a great idea. Um, you know, like this this particular bed here, this is a kit that's available from Berry Hill Irrigation. Um, they use the, the like a traditional tea tape, just like I use in my vegetables, um, in my crops, uh, on the big field um, in, in production. Um, this tape in a raised bed garden, though, will be good for four to five years, usually. Unless something, unless you have breaks or, you know, I've had crickets fight into it before in a dry year, trying to get to the water. Um, but for the most part, you can use this uh, for four to five years. Um, there are other systems out there. Rainflow has one. There are several different ones available. I really like the Mary Hill irrigation kits for small raised beds. There are other places too. Um, you know, if you're good at engineering and you can develop your own kit, you can get all these materials at Coastal Ag Supply in Hendersonville or Ag Care Products in Canada. And you can get the raw materials and build your own system. You can do that if you have a lot of area. You can do that much cheaper than buying a kit. But, you know, if you want everything kind of laid out for you, uh, there are people that you can actually call. And they'll say, well, I would recommend X, Y, and Z. Here's your pressure reducer. Here's your backflow preventer. Uh, do you want to fertigate, which I would recommend? Um, that way you can add even liquid fish emulsion if you want to fertigate with something organic. You can fertigate and add nutrient through your, your water system when you water. Um, if you're not worried about being organic, a hose-on siphon connector, you can get that from uh, Minus Farm Supply, Johnson City, Tennessee, or you can order it off Amazon. There's a 16 to 1 ratio, and you can fertilize water-soluble fertilizer like a miracle Grow vegetable mix or a liquid 20-20-20 liquid fertilizer. Uh, and it works very, very good. It's easy to do. Um, but there's lots of options with fertigation. So I would definitely add that to the system. Uh, here's some resources. Um, John Seed's quite expensive. Drip, so Drip Works is the main company. So if you want to see raised bed dry diagrams, that's a, a good site to go to. Berry Hill Irrigation has lots of very affordable kits. Uh, there are others out there. I mean, you can get an irrigation kit at Walmart or Lowe's. I mean, it, it's available, um, but these are usually a little more, like Berry Hill, I know they're a little more cost effective. They have some pretty reasonable kits, uh, but I just throw that in there. That is the, um, the site, a link. It's a long link, I know. Uh, if you just go to Berry Hill Drip, you can access most of their stuff or any of these places. You can also just do a search and bring it right up. If you would like any of these links sent to you, shoot me an email. If you're interested in drip systems or help with that, uh, I'll be glad to help you and, and send, email you links or, or whatever. Um, with the plant, I get that question a lot uh, from home gardeners. The more avid gardeners that have been gardening here for a while, many years, you, you probably know your dates. But we do have this resource from NC State Extension. It's in our Western North Carolina vegetable garden planting calendar. Um, if you just do a search, NC State Extension planting guide, it'll bring it up for that Western North Carolina. 
Um, what I would say in our area, so this that even this WC planning guide, it's the dates in it are designated for like Buckham County, Asheville, Hendersonville, Mills River. Okay, we're higher in elevation, so I would add four to five days to those spring planting dates. And if you'll notice on most things, if you look at that guide, it'll say like May the tenth for tomatoes. I will never recommend you plant for May the 15th. We've seen the kill and freeze here as late as May the 20th. Um, you know, that could kill a lot of our summer vegetables. That's an odd year. Most of the time, our last freeze in our area runs between the 10th and the 15th. So if you can plant May the 15th or after, you're usually going to be in, in good shape. Um, so look at those spring dates. Uh, add four to five days for most crops. You know, it's going to be earlier in March for things like peas. Um, the fall dates, we used to say back up. Um, but I don't know if it's climate change or, or what it is, but we've not had any issue with, with any fall, fall plant and harvest dates in the last few years. Um, I've harvested broccoli in Thanksgiving in the last two to two to five years. So, you know, there's lots of different crops when you talk about those fall crops that I believe we can we can plant farther. It's not to say you won't plant it and it won't get killed this year, <laughs> but in most cases, I think we can go and buy the, the fall fall dates for late crops is, is a pretty good scenario when they're planting the guy. All right. Do we have any questions that I have not addressed about raised bed gardens or anything that we just haven't hit on that you all would like to know? David, I have a question. Sure. Can you, can you hear me? I sure can. Um, you know, in the Seeds of Hope Garden, they put plastic down mm -hmm. and we had to cut it out from the raised beds, um, you mentioned putting plastic down for something earlier in the slide, and I I wanted to ask, when would plastic be advised, or ever, would it ever be? We, we knew that it was a, a problem having the plastic, it was like about six to seven inches below the top of the bed. Oh, yeah. No. So the, the plastic that I was talking about was in commercial production. We use plastic culture. And essentially what we do, the, the beds are raised in the field and the plastic's pulled very, very tight on the top of that bed. And that increases the soil temperature about 10 to 15 degrees in the spring. It'll do it all year long, but it, in the spring is when it does the most. So that basically increases our harvest time. And then we use that to keep weeds down, but it's just pulled very, very tight down on top of the soil. Um, and so, then, then when you plant, you remove it, right? Well, we actually plant into it, and then, you know, at the end of the year, we'll take it up after the season's over. We'll, we'll cut holes and plant the plants, but it's not under the soil. Let's stretch down on top okay. of it. You know, okay. basically it's like great. a weed bag. Yeah. That's where you burn the holes. You burn the holes and put the plants through the holes. Yeah. The plastic we use, it just we just use a machine that just punches. Don't really burn the holes. It just punches a hole. Then you okay. plant the plants right in the hole. Um, okay. You, you can do the same thing at home. The one thing I'll tell you, though, on the plastic, the only benefit that I really see uh, to plastic is the, the weed suppression because unless you have the machine that fits that plastic perfect, because it, it fits it very close to the soil surface, and that's what causes the heating effect. Mm -hmm. If that plastic is loose at all, it's going to lose a lot of that heat. Um, it'll and, and then moisture too. That's an issue. You you I would not do plastic at all unless you had drip irrigation underneath that plastic. What because about you can't, water, you can't water through the plastic, right? What about using uh, cardboard or uh, newspaper mm -hmm. around your plants? Um, do you advise that? It's that can help. Yeah, that can, that can help with weed control. Um, you know, and it breaks down. If I was going to use that, the newspaper is going to break down very quickly. The cardboard, don't use anything glossy. Only use the natural 
untreated. Um, and it is going to break down over time, but that can give you some good early season weed suppression. Okay. Good question. Any other questions? I need to add a slide about the carbon. That's pretty good. I hadn't thought about that. And weed suppression. It works really well for weed suppression. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And it usually lasts about a year if it's a good, heavy cardboard. Yeah. The newspaper doesn't, but the cardboard does. Right. Right. All right. So every year I get a few questions. That, that's kind of it on the raised bed. If you all have questions, feel free to ask them at the end. I'm going to have another slide here to do that um, in just a few minutes. Feel free to ask questions as we go along. If you think of things, you can always email me or call. Um, so please feel free to, to ask any questions that you can. Um, now I'm going to talk about this. This is kind of a niche version of raised bed gardening with small spaces. It's more for urban areas, but I've got some questions on it. So I thought I'd throw this in here. Has anybody ever heard of straw bale gardening? Okay, straw bale gardening, uh, basically it's a great option if you have limited mobility. If you have very poor soil quality, if you have very limited space, um, and then a few sources of high quality topsoil or compost um, in traditional raised beds, this is where you would use uh, uh, potting soil. It's kind of a niche thing that you may want to try. Uh, some people like it, some people don't. Uh, but what you need basically, first of all, straw bales. I wouldn't use hay because of the seed. <laughs> and if you've ever done this before, you know what I'm talking about. Um, the hay, the grass seed in the hay will just go crazy sometimes. Um, you'll need a hand trowel, a little bit of fertilizer or nitrogen source. You can also use organic fertilizer. Um, you need access to water. Uh, access to water hose is key uh, um, when you're conditioning bales and that kind of thing. And then some soil or compost if you're, if you're planting seeds or you can have transplants that you plant into these straw bales. Um, so when you place the bales, this is a picture of it. Uh, you can see somebody has placed these bales and they've actually made raised beds uh, that they're going to use. This tree kind of blocks the picture here, so I apologize for that. Um, but you got the raised beds here where they're growing like a traditional raised bed in the center of the straw bales. And then they're actually going back and adding plants to the, the straw bale. But Bales will not be able to move once they're conditioned, once you start this process. Uh, another place to put these bales would be like in a traditional garden plot where you really want to improve the soil because <laughs> this is going to break down over time. Uh, you want to choose a good planting location for vegetables, 8 to 10 hours of sunlight, just like with your raised beds. We didn't talk about that, but when you choose a location, make sure you have good sunlight. Um, you know, they say you can use any artistic impression or arrangement when you when you arrange these. Uh, plan to plant the tallest plants on the north end of the straw bale garden so they won't shade the smaller plants. And then you can also place in wax cardboard or heavy newspaper on the ground to keep the weeds from growing around the straw bales. Uh, don't use plastic because it needs to breathe. The moisture needs to be able to escape when it rains. You don't want to keep moisture in that's going to cause the straw bales to rot. Um, conditioning, basically you want to water thoroughly for about three days to keep the bales damp, um, getting them very good and moist, especially if you're going to plant the plants. Um, you can also, that should be sprinkle, not sprinkle, <laughs> sprinkle each bale with a little bit of urea or 10, 10, 10, and continue to water days four through six. Uh, cut back to a quarter cup of urea days seven through nine, but you're still adding more of that and watering it in basically building up a nutrient resource. Um, and then you want to stick your hand in the bales and see if they're warm, if they're cool to the touch, they're safe to, safe to plant. If not, wait until the bales are cool to the touch. One other thing I'll mention is basically you cut a place out of each of those bales like you see here, where your, your potted soil, your plants are going to be planted. Um, and so you're actually going to plant the plants down into the, into the bales there. I'm using like a, just a serrated knife, cutting about Halfway down in between the strings of the straw bale works works pretty well. 
So preparing the bales, uh, once you've got them conditioned, you've watered them in, you, you've cut the centers out, um, you've added fertilizer, like urea fertilizer, 10, 10, 10 fertilizer, you prepare the bales for planting, uh, which is add the compost to the center of the bale where you cut the hole in them, uh, and then, or, or a potting soil, uh, compost works best. Uh, then you can add your seeds or or then transplants. And you see in these pictures, this one over here is where they plant the seeds into the, the compost that's put in the center of the bale. Uh, here is where they planted the tomatoes in the center of the bale, um, which is traditionally what I've seen in most straw bale gardens is tomatoes. How deep a hole, David? Um, about four inches, depending on the size of the bale. Um, no more than half. Preferably like a third. Um, it really depends. You you would really like to go as deep as whatever plant you're using. So if you're using like a potted tomato plant, you want to go so that whole tomato root will fit down into that bale. Uh, feeding and watering, much like a traditional garden. Um, you know, as the, the plants begin to grow, the fruit begins to develop. Um, and you're also trellising or whatever, just like a traditional raised bed garden. Um, you know, you're, you need to add some maintenance fertilization. With straw bale garden, I heavily recommend watering through drip. Um, you know, so using a hose on connector, using liquid fish emulsion to add fertility on a weekly basis. Uh, you can use a miracle grow mix as well. Um, you want to begin fertilizing when the plant begins to develop its first fruit and then fertilize all the way through to the end of harvest. Um, it's even more important with strong blow gardening because you have more nutrient available in your compost than traditional raised bed gardening. So you basically, this is kind of like, almost like hydroponics in a way. Um, you know, you've got, to, you've got to keep the fertility coming so the plants will grow. Another thing I'll say on this is don't use like indeterminate varieties of tomato plants, for instance, or things that are going to grow very large, this is where you really want to use those patio varieties, those smaller varieties in these straw bales. 